Okay, I'm going to get started. And we seem to have uh, 24 people here at the moment, and there may be more that join us. So welcome to uh, Tuesday's Telltales, brought to you by the Australian Sites Communicators from South East Queensland. I'd like to thank in particular Melina Gillespie and Michelle Redlinger for organising, and they're on hand to help with the technical side of things as well. Before I introduce Fabian, I would like to acknowledge the First Nations people on the various different lands on which we all live and work. I'm currently on North Stradbroke Island, which is Kwandamuka country, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This has always been a country of learning and research and communication. But let me introduce to you one of my favourite people, the fabulous, the fearless, and thankfully, the sometimes frivolous, Dr. Fabian Medbecki. Fabian is a senior lecturer in science communication at Otago University. Um, and he followed that, before that, he was at the University of Queensland in science communication, working with the equally wonderful Dr. Joan Leach. That was where I first met Fabian. And he just finished a degree in philosophy after a life change from being a chef. Now he calls himself a social epistemologist. I'm not totally sure what that is, and I'll come back to it. It sounds a lot like a pissed entomologist, Fabian. Very but close. It's very close. <laughs> very close. Tuesday Telltales is all about stories, which means it's about people, and it's not just what they do, and it's not just the technicalities of science communication practice or research. Um, if you have any questions of Fabian, please put them in the Q&A. You can even upvote other people's questions in the Q&A, or you can put it in the chat. We'll be monitoring it and make sure that your questions are answered as far as we can. Now, Fabian, first of all, I wanted to ask you, I know you've been in Australia and now in New Zealand, you have some French, maybe German heritage, perhaps no, Hungarian. No German. Oh, no, no, German. No German. Oh, that's just a girlfriend. Um, perhaps there's some Hungarian nobility, because I did a little bit of a search on the name Medvecki, and it originates from the 13th century, mm -hmm. where the family was given the title of squire, so also minor aristocracy. Yes. So who are you? What are you? So the story of Medvecki is actually really interesting. There were a minor uh, nobility, and it literally means, Medvecki means off the bear. And the mythology, or at least the, the story of it, is that one of my ancestors way back when, was actually in Slovakia, uh, killed a bear that was attacking the local prince. And he was given land and a title and the name Medveki. And that's where it came from. But the nicest part is that this, the castle that this was associated with is the castle in a couple of the Dracula movies, particularly the very first one, Nosferatu, is filmed in the Medveki castle. So I kind of think there's a sort of, sort of vampire element to that story too, which just kind of adds to the story. Um, I always knew you were a man of mystery and excitement, Fabian. Um, I only had to go to a conference with you in Poznan in Poland to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> now, Fabian's actually at a standing desk. I'm sitting at a desk, but this is time to relax, enjoy, um, get your favorite tipple and listen and ask questions. So first of all, Fabian, I'd like to go back to your childhood. Did you, did you have a dream one day that you would be a famous science communicator? What is it that led you to where you are Only now? that you mentioned this. Uh, no, I didn't have a dream of this at all. In fact, I, I had various ideas of what I'd do and I did none of these for a long time. I, uh, truth is, I, I had a funny path to all this. I, I left school and left home quite young. I was in Australia and I, uh, I think my way of rebelling against my parents was to leave home largely. And then, but I was always quite philosophical and quite academically interested. My parents are both quite academic. So my rebellions failed completely because I've ended up being just as they were. But at the time it felt powerful, deluded, but powerful. Anyway, so I left and I went into food. I was actually a baker, not, not a chef, but in the food industry. And so I became a baker and I worked in this for many years. And then I found myself bored and drawn back to academia. I'd always read a lot. I read often quite academic texts just for the fun of it, which is probably sad more than anything else. But, you know, 
that's just that's what it is and so um eventually i end up going back to academia and how old were you at this stage Fabian? i was 29 about to turn 30 when i started my undergrad okay so i think the message to people out there is that if you want to change careers you can and Actually, you did times. it in your 30s yeah yeah absolutely and that was my undergrad so i didn't you know so i had to go through the whole undergrad and everything else and even then i changed because i started off really doing philosophy philosophy uh, so philosophy was there something about being a baker that led you to philosophy or what was it that attracted you to philosophy as something to study i've always thought of it as being philosophy is like people thinking um not really doing very much was that what it attracted you <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> I, I, there is an element where we don't do much that's practical, but in a way for me, philosophy is like, it's actually in a way like chefing, actually, in that everyone cooks or most people cook, but chefs learn the trick of the trades to cook well. And I think everyone thinks about things somehow, but we're often not very structured in our thinking about things. And philosophy is a very structured way of thinking th through things. And that, that kind of structure really appealed to me. And it, it felt really naturally when I started my undergrad, I did a bunch of degrees. You know, I did a, the usual banquets of possible subjects my first year. And philosophy, just it was just natural. I did philosophy and history, but philosophy was the one that just said the most naturally for me. And I was particularly attracted to two sides of philosophy, the kind of ethical, moral aspect, and then the very formal aspects of philosophy of science, philosophy of mathematics, that kind of stuff. So what do you see as being the connection between philosophy and science communication? I think science communication that isn't thought about isn't worth doing. I think what differentiates for me science communication from preaching and preaching for me is something that's problematic because of this difference is that science communication is based on a deep reflection and thoughtfulness that includes a sort of rigor about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Uh, preaching is about selling a message for me in some ways. So do you, do you equate people who practice science communication like myself and I'll disagree with you if you do. If you do equate people like us as being preachers no. and researchers as being the more... Not famous. at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I think, in fact, I mean, most people who I know who do science communication are quite thoughtful about their practice, not just about their practice, but also about where they get the information from, right? There's this real scrutiny about what it is that you talk about, how you come to make the view that something is worth talking about. And I think the, the re re relationship here is a relationship to something that we might think of as somehow at least truth related, right? I mean, that's, that's the essence of science is that we get to something that's at least as close to the truth as we're going to get. And that deep connection to that, to something that, that is evidence-based truth is a really, really big part, I think, of what makes science communication. And so for me, I guess that's the... Um, that's the connection with philosophy is that to think through this stuff is, is really important. So I certainly wouldn't say that you're a, a preacher. So you'd be excellent as a preacher if you were one. Okay. Um, with lots of funding cuts in research, philosophy often is like the arts looked at as being a fairly useless sort of thing. People yeah. sitting around thinking. So what is the value of philosophy and what do, does it bring to science communication? It's a funny thing that we might think of philosophy as being useless because it doesn't have this direct applicability. Some areas do, right? Things like bioethics. And I mean, the whole ethical discourse is clearly important for science communication. How do we talk about contentious issues? So all that stuff is there. But when it comes to science directly, what we think of classically as the scientific method didn't come out of science. It came out of philosophy, right? It came out of Popeian views about how we go about examining truth. So... To this day, much of what we take to be the scientific process is very much philosophically inclined. And then science takes that and applies it, in fact, in some ways. But for 
for science communication particularly, I think what's really interesting is also the relationship between how knowledge is made and discussed and shaped in social settings, because that's what we do, right? We take a bit of knowledge that we take from somebody else we read about and we trust that to be true. We could be wrong about that, by the way, but we take it to be true. Then we pass it on and we hope people will trust us that we're telling the truth. And so there's this really complicated thing that happens around how knowledge is created. And these are deeply philosophical questions about what does it mean to be in that space? How do we do it? What's our duty towards the people that we communicate to? What's our relationship to them? Um, well, I've got an interesting question already from Emma Rain. Um, and it brings me back to this thing about you talking about preachers in science communication, which scares me because my father was a preacher and I never wanted to do anything that my father did. <laughs> Um, but Emma asks, do you also think that science communication has more of an engagement element to it, like a two-way conversation in contrast to preaching? Absolutely. I mean, I think science communication is a really, really broad, broad field. Um, but And I think the main point for me is that it's this kind of connection to empirical based knowledge, right? It's the science part. Otherwise, it's just communication generically. So, yeah, absolutely, there is. And I mean, what science communication is as a field is so broad. And to be fair, when I first moved into science communication, I had, you know, the same, I think, naive view that many people have, that science communication was this kind of popularizing, just talking about the stuff in public. And of course, that's changed a lot through my work. Now, I'm, I'm involved with a bunch of projects where we do exactly this kind of stuff when we're interacting with whole bunch of stakeholders about how we come to hold views and make decisions about those things. So really good question. Absolutely. Engagement is a really, really big part. Um, I wanted to talk, ask a little bit more about how you did it. Was it a choice or did you fall into science communication? And in your role in science communication, has it mostly been in that academia rather than practice? Uh, it's the, the way I came to science communication was really, really interesting. It came out of a, me being disgruntled with economics, actually. I was doing a PhD on the philosophy of economics. It was my thesis, particularly the economics of climate change. And the one thing that I noticed is that was that all the discussion around climate change was, all, was largely scientifically based. This is just over 10 years ago now. And in fact, at the policy level, the whole debate was around the economic stuff, particularly this one small measure that was really heavily debated. And I thought, isn't it just weird and bizarre that scientists are really going to get in themselves out? There's all this work to promote the scientific discussion, and we hear nothing, and I mean nothing, about the economics. And so you, you do seem to have this unhealthy fascination with economics. I have a graduate degree in economics too. Oh no, that's what makes that's, you scary. That's how it came, that's how it came to be a science community. So I found this really interesting. And I wrote a couple of articles for the ABC's opinion pieces, making a case that, you know, why isn't economics talked about? And in the way, why don't we communicate economics? Because we know about the economy, but the economy is not economics, right? The economy is like nature and economics is like science. It's how we make sense of this stuff. And from that, uh, Joan, who was the, Joan Leach, Dr. Joan Leach, who was the director of the program at UQ said, oh, do you want to teach for me? And then I kind of slowly... She kind of slowly pulled me into this science communication world, but I guess I was already partially in there because I'd already written some articles about this. So, so how do you feel now that you're in that science communication space? And do you just do research or do you do practice as well? It's a funny world. I do do practice. I don't do popularizing science communication. So in one sense of science communication, the view that's often viewed classically kind of imagined. I don't do that. So I did, I just ran a series of events here during the science festival. I ran a two day public event with speakers and so forth. And I organized that and put that on. Uh, I'm doing a project. So what do you call that if it's not popularization? Well, there was discussions and there was debates and there was all sorts of parties involved. So there's an element of that, but it's also probably been more engaging than that. So two way communication happening. Yes. And then I also, I'm doing one project particularly where I'm working with high risk forest users in terms of forest biosecurity. 
I'm working with some people uh, with high risk users of the forests um, to see what biosecurity measures they would want. And I'm working with them and with rangers and with the councils. So that's a much more engagement participatory pro process. For me, that's a form of practicing science communication. And how does it make you feel being in this space? I mean, you've become quite famous internationally, Fabian. How does it feel? Confused uh, is how I feel <laughs> most of the time. Uh, I mean, at heart, I'm still a philosopher. I like the philosophical questions. They're what make me tick. But they're also, they're what kind of make me tick if I think in a completely selfish way by my own little corner of the world. But I also know that they have often no clear or obvious kind of, they, they do relate to the rest of the world, but in more tenuous ways. And so I really do enjoy that interactive space. Uh, I, I like that I get to do a bit of everything. I mean, in fact, I'm really happy in this field because I think it's a really, the one thing with science communication that's both sometimes really challenging and really beautiful is that it's so broad and it is so permissive. So you can do all sorts of stuff. You can do anything from very analytic studies. You can do some completely cerebral work. You can do some really applied things. You can... And it's all within that space. And so that's really rich. Yeah, no, I think I find that exciting too. I'm going to go to a, another couple of questions. One in chat from our good colleague, Marina Yaber. She said, should we be at teaching philosophy of science in science communication degree programs? I do. Um. <laughs> but should we, Fabian, should we? <laughs> I think we should. I, I mean, I think... No, maybe not necessarily philosophy of science, but I think people who, I think if we teach science communication, it's good for people to know what they mean by science when they do so. I think it's a matter of kind of integrity about your own position. If you are going to be a science communicator and you distinguish yourself from just being a communicator more generally, then what is that difference? What does a science add to your, to your place? And so for me, that's inherently, at least partially philosophical. Uh, and back, just before I go on to some other questions, harking back to what you said about economic and teaching and, and, and communicating about the economy and the science of the economy, do you think that should be included in science communication courses? That's really tough. I'd say I'm not sure because there is a set of knowledge within the economic, within economics. And so one of the challenges actually knowing that basis as there is a set of basis within science. So yes, I think we should have something for communicating economics. Um, but then there needs to be some pathway created so that people who communicate about economics actually know the economics. Um, of, co of course, in Europe, they call all research science. So presumably ec economics research is also referred to as science. Yes. But it's not always the case, right? And, and the, one of the catches that economists are particularly not interested in being engaged. There's uh, been a couple of studies about, about economists' view of, kind of engagement with other disciplines. And of all the social scientists, they're the only ones who don't, don't usually engage with other disciplines. I'm going to go to a couple of other questions that are relevant to this conversation on chat. David Bicknell, who also asked a question on Q&A, which I'll come to shortly, asked whether there should be a separation between hard and soft sciences, between physics and social science. I think to some extent there already is. I'm, I'm not sure that there needs to be one. In fact, I'm not sure it's particularly helpful. In fact, I think the whole idea of science is something separate. It might be unhelpful in some ways. For me, what's important is knowledge, good, reliable, rigorous knowledge. My concern more than anything else is that science is not, hom it's not homogenous. The physicist is so far from an ecologist that in fact, as an economist, I'm more familiar with ecology than most theoretical physicists would be. And so to, pre to, to kind of lump all the biophysical sciences into one world seems to me a, a category mistake actually, fundamentally. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what I think really matters actually is that we should communicate about knowledge, not necessarily science. It needs to be about good, rigorous knowledge, whether that's history, whether that's economics, whether that's ecology, or whether that's physics. 
Okay. Hazel Wallace makes a comment, but I think it also leads to a question. She says that one of the most valuable parts of her health degree has been to learn about processes of science and how research is done. And she says there seems to be a large gap in the public sphere about what science is actually, actually is and how it happens, and that this knowledge should be more accessible publicly. Do you have any thoughts on that? Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. I think that's one of the big challenges. And I think there might be some historical baggage to this, that part of the story that has been kind of the early, kind of if we think post, um, post World War II, the move to, to make science more presentable and more socially appealing was this very glorious heroic story. And the heroic story of somebody struggling and not getting anything isn't particularly heroic. So, you know, and, and we, in a way, we keep repeating this. There's this, you know, we keep repeating, for example, that the COVID vaccine was made within a year. You know, it was so quick, but that's rubbish, right? Moderna has been around for 10 years. They've been working on this stuff for 10 years. They didn't make it up in a year. The lady who first came up with our RNA as a process for health in the early 90s, Hungarian scientist uh, at, well, where was she? Uh, was she your cousin? I'm Slovak, not Hungarian. Um, yeah. Close. Um, she was actually demoted in the mid 90s, which is pretty rare in academia because she couldn't get enough grants. And eventually people went, actually, maybe what she's doing is all right. And, you know, 15 years later, they set up a company and now we have vaccines because of it. But, but when we get the vaccines, we say, look, we did it within a year. Isn't science amazing? And Pfizer has a big logo that says science will win. And so I think there's also a matter of humility for the sciences about the limits of what we can do, which comes with that. Uh, I agree, we need to make that discussion. I think we need to talk about uncertainty, about messy things, about experiments gone wrong, about what we don't know, about we need to have that humility. Um, and there might be a cost, it might lead to more disbelief, but I'm not sure that it will, to be honest with you. I think that's, I think we need to do this. I think though it would also take a bit of humility from some science sectors that may not be something people want to do. Lee Constable asks a controversial question on uh, Q&A. &A. And, um, and she says, should we be calling it research or technical communication rather than science communication? Absolutely. Um, completely. I mean, you know, I, I like the idea of knowledge. Um, there is there are, there's a move in the UK with research for all, which goes towards that. Um, technical might feel like it has a different spin. I think it's I think we should think about more than just science. I think there is so much knowledge that's really valuable. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't think it's controversial. I think it's just right. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to come back to a couple of questions that have just popped up a little bit later because I wanted to, to get to deliver on some of the things we promised. Um, and firstly, anti-science. You mentioned about we now live in a world of COVID and vaccines and there's very obvious um, anti-science sediments out there, although some would say that anti-vaxxers aren't necessarily anti-science. But how does SciComm or ResearchCom or whatever we want to call it deal with anti-science? So firstly, I don't think there is anti-science. I think there's anti-certain claims of expertise. But if you look at kind of trust in science for the last 30 years, and there's a lovely paper by Schuffel a couple of years back, it basically hasn't changed. Science is about the most trusted institution across the world. There's a lovely thing where, you know, just about any, any, you know, the same people who might be anti-vaxxers might also be the same people who very, very much are concerned about climate change because they believe the science. So they're not anti-science and usually people who are anti-vaccines have bad scientific reasons, which they claim to be scientific. So there's still an appeal to science. I think it's not anti-science, but there is a deep distrust in expertise. That's true. I think that's true. And there's disputes around expertise. And that's really, really problematic. So what can we do about that distrust and uh, around expertise and expert knowledge? Well, I wish I knew. But that, 
there's a couple of things that I think that we can say that we can do. One of the things, I mean, the one space that generates more distrust is in contentious issues, is when issues become polarized. And in fact, um, Dan Sarah has got this lovely description. He does a lot of work in the US for, for around our policy advice. And it talks about not whether an issue is, whether a scientific issue is controversial, but whether controversy becomes scientized. So whether something that is an issue of topic, whether the science gets brought into that issue or not. And the claim he makes, which I think is quite true, is that when we can separate the values from the scientific claims cleanly, it's less easy for it to become controversial and to kind of fit into this distributive of expertise. And when we can't, we fit into that. There's also questions about whether or not there's gains to be made from kind of disputes of expertise and so forth. And as communicators, we can't do much but other people's intentions. But one thing we can do is to be really explicit about the limits of what science is when it is something that is a scientific claim that is an empirical factual claim and when it is a value claim and when those and to separate those clearly and to be careful not to muddle them. And I think sometimes we do muddle them. When we make claims like science tells us we should do X, well, science really tells us what we should do. Science tells us that if we do X, something will happen, but it can't tell us what we should do as such. That's a different question. And so to be really clear, I think is probably one thing we can do to try and, and minimize the harm to general respective expertise. Now, along with that sense of anti-expertise, there is also a sense by some that there are people just ignorant out there. Although I was talking to a friend the other day who said that it's not ignorance, it's a cognitive inability to understand the rational argument that some experts have. How do we make sense of such ignorance or cognitive dissonance? I mean, what do we do? So, yeah, I wouldn't think of it as ignorance either because I think it's more stubbornness and an unwillingness to accept certain um, rationales. I think one thing also is to think about who's the messenger, right? I mean, sometimes we have no right to speak to some people about some things. We're not the right people. And we don't have the right connections. We don't have the right credibility. Being an expert doesn't necessarily give us the credit. In being an, a scientific expert, for example, doesn't necessarily give somebody the credibility to speak to a certain audience. So I think we need to also be thoughtful about that. Um, at the end of the day, there's also people who are just not going to believe every, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. That's also true. And so we have to also be aware about what we can do, right? How much, what's the limits of what science communication can do? Because there are limits. And it's important to communicate that. Yeah. You talked about credibility. You've talked about limits. You've talked about trust. What about morals? Um, is I there, I know that. I've hung out with you enough to know that. But is there, um, is there a morally good way or ethical way of doing science communication. You and Joan have published a book on the ethics of science communication. I was going to say there's a great book that's come out on this, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is, I think there are some things to be considered. I think for me, the core about ethical behavior is that it's not following a list. It's about being thoughtful about what you do and having good reason or justification for what you do. I think um, that's really important. So there's, there's, there's some things that are particularly relevant when we do science communication. I think one of them is certainly the utility of the information. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that gets communicated because it's fun and interesting. And sometimes it doesn't serve anything. And that's okay too. If they are misentertained, that's fine. But I think we also need to be aware about what it is, this, what's the purpose of what we're communicating given what people can do with that information. There's also, I think, a question about um, the timing of when we communicate. 
So, so do we do it at the right time? How early? The timing both for where it sits within the world, where it sits within in relation to the, our audience and to ourselves. I think that's something we need to be cognizant of. But I also think one really, really important part, and it links to this idea, this idea that I mentioned earlier of humility, and it's being generous and it's accepting that we have limits, that we don't know everything, that there's other people who know a whole bunch of stuff. And they may not know stuff that's directly related to what we're talking about, but they might know stuff that's tangentially important. And so being generous with other people, with their time, with their knowledge, being humble about our own knowledge. I mean, we don't know very much. Even the most knowledgeable of us are largely, largely ignorant about most things. And so I think that's probably something that we could do that would make us more, better communicators. It's, you know, it depends on the political context. But I think humility is probably something that we would do very well to, to foster as a skill. Um, there's a, some interesting comments on chat, but um, Hazel talks about um, how sociology talks and social theory talk about the importance of empathy. Does, does empathy and ethics go hand in hand? Empathy is part of it. Um, it depends on what you're doing. But I think, yes, I think, it's, I think it's acknowledging where the other person is, which is a really important aspect. So, yeah, I think that's part of it. That's part of that kind of generosity towards the others. Yeah. I think um, what you said about humility is reflected in a, a question from Craig Cormick. Hi, Craig. And he says, if this is largely all about trust, distrust, and looking for messages that align with your values and beliefs, do we need to bring science down off the high pillar? and make it more connected to many people who might be distrustful of it. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I guess I, I think we do. I think scientists are getting, I think we're getting better at not being quite high and mighty. And I think, you know, there was a school of science communicators who were very, who were kind of often viewed as kind of the science, you know, were popular, the likes of Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. And, you know, there was a whole trove of them for a while that had a certain mode of communication that was, I think, fair to say, not particularly humble or generous or caring. I think that's a fair comment to make. Um, I think that's certainly changed. I think it also depends on the kind of communication. If you're doing this kind of participatory stuff we we're talking about earlier, this engagement stuff, then you have to be humble because you have to acknowledge you just don't know that much, actually that there's so much that others can bring. And if you don't have that, then, then you're not really going to engage with them. Um, so I, I think there is an element. But at the same time, I think we want to be weary of leveling out all knowledges as being able to speak equally on all topics. There is something about the rigor of science, right? I think we don't want to be dismissive of that either. So it's a fine line between holding one's ground in our knowledge, saying, look, this is, there's good value in this knowledge. There's reasons we take this, but doing that without thinking that it means we know everything. So it's knowing what it, we, we what, uh, for me, it's about knowing what space of knowledge we own without transgressing from there onto what we don't own. Not giving ground either, but not transgressing and having this kind of clarity about our space. I just want to give you a really lovely anecdote. We've, we have a, a chief science advisor uh, started a couple of years ago, the new one, uh, Juliet Gerard. She's wonderful. And I was listening to a talk by her the other day at the Science Festival. And she said that her, she sees her role as a science advisor, not to tell what science know, but to ask what science can bring. And so she goes to the prime minister and she says, what do you want science to tell you? What can we bring to the, to the table for you? And that's for me quite a, I think that's quite a lovely way of thinking about how to communicate science to a specific audience. Uh, and it's quite different to often the way we think about communication of science. Yeah, that leads me to a, a question from David Bicknell, who makes a comment that there's no such thing in behavior change as rational non-adoption. We do not always know an individual's risk nature or past experience. How do we communicate to meet individual needs? Can we go to easy questions after this one? Yeah, but <laughs> we've got about uh, eight minutes left, so yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's probably 
No, well, actually, I'm not sure that it's true that people don't make rational choice. I think sometimes people do make choices that would seem irrational, depending on how we define rationality. I think sometimes we have this really cognitive dissonance where we don't even agree with our own selves um, and those kind of things. So I, don't, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that we are rational, but I think we can also, people can also quite often come to rational views that we find fundamentally problematic. I mean, as I said, my original move into science communication was from the economics of climate change. And while I might find it abhorrent, there's something perfectly rational with saying, well, you know what, we're going to live well for the next 50 years and stuff everyone thereafter. I might find it ethically abhorrent, but it's not irrational. And if somebody says to me, it's irrational not to care about the future, well, no, it's not. It might be abhorrent, but it's not the same thing as irrational. <laughs> and that's that when you go to the moral claims, right, and go beyond the scientific. David also asked a simpler question earlier in the, in the session where he, where he asked, can we really call it communication when most practitioners are just pushing information? Oh, I think there are many more practitioners than that. I think in some ways we've often also reduced the scope of what we mean by practitioners. I think in some ways many people would not consider me a practitioner. And when you asked me before, I've had to revise my own view by myself and think, actually, I do stuff in engagement. I do run the odd event. I do this thing. So, yes, I am a practitioner. Just not in this kind of popularizing way. So I think there's a two-way game here about what we imagine practice to be and what practice does. Okay, I wanted to ask you a question for myself and then I'm going to go to a, a career question. And the question is, as a science communication researcher and practitioner, is there one project that you've worked on that's really given you a buzz and if so, tell us about it. There's been lots. Just one. One. Very good number one. <laughs> one highlight. Ooh. You should have you should have told me this beforehand, so I could have thought about it. There was right. one project that was a really strange little project. Um, the local, the regional council was having some debates about lake health so not far from here in grand queenstown beautiful beautiful part of the world the central Otago, they have a bunch of lakes and they have some um, problems there with some uh, uh, pollution and there was concerns about what that was and what was going on there and so they held a couple of town hall meetings and inevitably a town hall meeting on a tuesday night you have the loudest voice who dominate and the council weren't sure that this was really what was going on or that this was representative of the community and so forth. And so I got chatting with them. And I suggested that maybe rather than having it on a night when families can't come because they're putting the kids to bed or whatever else, and really the only people who are going to come on a Tuesday night are those who have really strong views, they should maybe think about something different. And so I worked with them, with the regional council, with members of the university, and we put together an event to a day event, barbecue, we had a, a, a lab in a box, which is this kind of container, that shipping container that's been transformed into, into a, a portable lab. So we brought up there, people could go and look at things, bring their own samples from the lake, do a whole bunch of stuff. There was local people, who scientists, all sorts of stuff, a real big public engagement event for the day. And we had about five, 600 people come through, families, locals, tourists, whatever. And we surveyed a whole bunch of them. Then we followed a few up with interviews and we wrote a report for the, for the council. Um, there was a few difference from what they had at the town hall meetings, maybe not enormous, but some. But it was the first time that many of the locals had spoken to count people from the council, other than in this kind of really unpleasant confrontational way. And so the report was good and the project was reasonably interesting. But the loveliest part for me was that after this, the council used that model to go through their consultation process for the next 10-year plan across the region. And that's really, really beautiful because that wasn't the aim, right? The aim was just to solve one problem, but it worked. And I don't think, you know, they'd ever, I don't think they go, oh, Fabian did a good job. They went, that was a good event. And I don't care whether, you know, about anything else. I just think it's really beautiful to think I contributed to something that's really made a difference to how the council then goes forward and thinks about how it engages with its community. And I think you put your finger very much there on what I think um, <laughs> science communicators are about, and that is creating positive change. 
Mm. And that's really what gives me a buzz. I'd like to go to a, a last question um, from Carrie and Conaway, who says, as someone really interested in a lot of things, I'm currently struggling to make career decisions and decide what I really want to do, uh, make, uh, spend my time on. Much like you with philosophy, my primary interest is history. And I'm not sure whether I should actually be focusing on that rather than trying to merge it with science communication. What advice would you give to young researchers in terms of choosing things to focus on or making career decisions? I never have thought I would have become a science communicator, like not in a million years, right? I don't have a communication background. I don't have a science background. I am the most ill-fitted human to be in science communication. Uh, in a way, that's why it's perfect. And so I get history. My, my major was in philosophy and my minor was in history. So I love that whole kind of world, um, classical thinking world, for lack of a better term. But would I want to be full time with historians or with philosophers? Probably not, actually. And the one thing I say for science communication, if you find the right home, and it's about finding the right home in that space, but it's a big space, you can do all sorts of stuff in a way that very few fields allow you to do. And that's a wonderful stuff. I just got an email today from somebody that, I think it's at the University of Twente, they're looking at somebody who does narrative analysis. And that's coming through for science communication. So they're looking at kind of historical narratives, right? So you can do this kind of stuff. You might do stuff that's very academic. One of the best people in science communication in New Zealand, um, is a, is a historian of nuclear science, Rebecca Priestley. She's wonderful and she's a, a really good historian. And so, you know, you can take this. For me, if you aren't sure what you do because there's more than one thing you want to do, actually science communication is great. Um, if you want to do one thing always the same, then science communication, you'll probably be okay at it, but I think you'll probably, you'll probably miss out on what, it's, what it can do. That'd be my hunch. Thank you, uh, Fabian. I think I can echo those thoughts. I would like to thank everyone who stayed on for, for this webinar. Um, I know that many of you are in lockdown or in difficult situations in your places where you live. My thoughts are with you and I, I know Fabian's are as well. Um, I would like to thank the people that I see who, who are still here. Alex, Anne Marie, Caitlin, Krista, Christina, Craig, David, Emma, Haynes, Hazel, Jeannie, Carrion, Kogolok, me sorry if I pronounce that wrong Lee Lily Marina Mar Michelle Ned Tess y Yana Asifan and Yovani thank you so much for participating in this session it's been lovely to have you here and thank, thank you, you very much Dr Fabian Medvecki a pleasure once again to talk with you thanks Jenny thanks everyone it's been really great and more please <laughs> <laughs>